We are in a generational defining moment for our country. And what we're doing here, what we're doing here is not just determining the kind of tax code we're going to have. What we are doing here is determining the kind of country we're going to have. One in six Americans have actually stopped talking to a family member or, or a close friend because of politics. So that we're actually more polarized than the Israelis and Palestinians. That's how much we actually don't understand each other. Today we want to talk about passion, passion. I tell you, if it, uh, a lot of things get done and take place because of personal passions. Sometimes our passions get sidetracked. Sometimes we tend to be passionate about things that really when it's all said and done, it's not going to matter. There's nothing wrong with enjoying things and enjoying life and being able to do different things, different activities and all those kinds of things, but there are certain things that are not necessarily wrong, but if they become your passion... You end up spending too much time, too much effort, and too much money in whatever that activity may be. And so what's wrong with that? Well, let, let me ask you a question. What are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? Webster defines passion as, quote, the state or capacity of being acted on by external agents or forces, intense, driving, or overmastering feeling. Jesus talks about passion in this way. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 19, Jesus shares some words of wisdom to us, obviously, but he wants us to understand the weight of our passions. He says in verse 19, he says, Don't collect for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust are destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me repeat that. For where your treasure is, whatever it is that you treasure, there's where your heart will be, and it will be obvious. He says in verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes uh, are bad, you hold your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can be slaves of two masters. Since either he will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and of money. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to focus on that particular issue. So, oh, he's going to talk about money. No, no. There's an illustration here that Jesus gives us. That the mind and the heart cannot have two masters. So the question is, to answer the question, what is your passion it's probably closely linked to what is or who is your master. What is it that really gets your attention and gets you going and gets you up in the morning? In John chapter 4, verse 31, 
It says, in the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. You know, the, the, to put everything in context, he had just spoke to the woman at the well, and, and uh, he gave her a spiritual living water. Remember that? And she goes and she shares everything. She shares her transformation to the whole town and so forth and bringing them back to Jesus. But the disciples come back and, of course, they're a little upset because he's talking to a Samaritan woman uh, uh, and, and their minds are thinking half-breed, you know, outcast. We don't talk. We don't associate with the Samaritans. And they find Jesus having a conversation with a woman at the well, not only a Samaritan woman, but a woman with a reputation. Remember the conversation he has. But, of course, Jesus transformed her life. He talks about this living water. And then disciples come along. They, they don't like it, so they start interjecting, not in a spiritual sense, but in a physical sense. They're, they're, they're acting like they're concerned about Jesus, whether he's eating lunch or not. And they ask, in the meantime, it's like urgent, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have no food to eat. Excuse me, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples said to one another, could someone have brought him something to eat? Did somebody stop by McDonald's or somewhere and get him something? <laughs> they missed the whole point. There wasn't a McDonald's back then, just so y'all know. But Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus told him, look, this is what drives me. This is why I do what I do. Because I have a sincere passion and desire to do my Father's will. Number one in your notes, your passions determine the direction of your life. Your passions will determine the direction of of your life. If someone who knows very little about you decides to investigate your life, what will he or she discover about you? My dad used to say this, and uh, for a lot of sports fanatics, this is kind of offensive, but my dad used to have this saying, he says, if aliens were to visit planet Earth, I think their first reaction would be they must worship a ball. With all of all shapes and sizes. Now I know that's not funny for y'all that love sports, but I, but I can't help but think if aliens did visit us, and they watched us, what would they determine about our religious beliefs as a whole? Here's the point: if people were to investigate your life, they look at your checkbook, they look at your schedule, they look at your career, they follow you to work. What would they find out about you? Because whatever you're passionate about will show up wherever you go. Let's just say I'm going to pick on, I, you know, I was talking about this a little bit ago. Uh, what if your passion is bowling? Now, not a whole lot of people bowl. A lot of people prefer other sports. I'm going to pick on a different sport. Okay, what if you're an avid bowler? What if you're very passionate about your bowling? So somebody comes in and they investigate. They look at your checkbook and they say, okay, he spends a lot of time at the bowling alley. He likes to buy nice his own balls. He's got a, you know, he bought a brand new ball. He bought a ball here. He bought some nice shoes here. Oh, look at those shoes. I mean, yeah, yeah. And then, then he looks at his schedule and he's got a tournament Monday night, Wednesday night, Sunday night. Um, they look at his schedule and, Bowling's always, I mean, look at his count. Bowling's always in bold print above everything else. It seems like this would be a highlight of their week, so it's obvious to them. When they go to work, they talk about bowling. They talk about how good they did the other night. I bowled over such and such and so and so. And they go on and on and on. But if somebody comes in their life that doesn't know them and they investigate every walk during that week, wherever they go, whatever they talk about, whatever they do, what do you think the conclusion would be? They're passionate about bowling, right? Is there anything wrong with enjoying that? No, there's nothing wrong with enjoying bowling. There's nothing wrong with playing in tournaments. There's nothing wrong with, with bowling. There's nothing wrong with buying new shoes. But the question is, does that livelihood override everything else? So whatever you're passionate about 
will show up. And I guarantee you, if you ask your closest friends, what do you think I'm passionate about? What would they say? What is the reason behind what we spend our money on, what we spend our time on, what we spend our abilities on? What what is the reason behind it? Why do we do what we do? What gets us up in the morning? What is it that we look forward to? I mean, some of you look forward to Fridays. You're always thinking, okay, hump day, it's Wednesday, two more days to Friday. Let me think, let me just let me just back up for a second. There's nothing wrong with looking forward to the weekend. But if you're living a life that glorifies God, you can look forward to Monday morning. Oh, you don't understand. Do you know where I work? Do you know who I work for? I I, I get it. I look forward to going to work. I look forward to working with the guys I work with. I couldn't have said that a few years ago, but, man, I can now. I love I love picking their brains and having conversations, that kind of thing. But I think what drives our environment here at the church, not just because we're a church staff and we're pastors and that kind of thing, that's not the point, is that we're trying to figure out better ways all the time of how we can bring glory to God. Now, I'm not, you say, well, Hilton, that's easy on your side, and I get that. But think about where you're at and what you do. Think about the influence you have. Think about the people you have a conversation with. Does Jesus ever come up? The spiritual conversations ever come up? Have you ever got up in the morning, Monday morning, and says, Lord, this is Monday morning, I'm getting ready to go to work. God, use me for your glory. God, give me an opportunity to share my faith in some way, shape, or form, whether it be demonstration of words. God, give me an opportunity to make a difference today. Do you ever go to work with anticipation and prayer, preparing yourself for those moments that God will give you? I promise you this, it doesn't change the schedule, but it changes your mindset. And when it changes your mindset, you see the opportunities. And if you see the opportunities and your mind's on Jesus, Jesus is going to come up. Right? Ladies, when you were planning your wedding, I bet you everybody you got around was tired of hearing about your wedding plans. I remember sitting at a table and doing this little, helping out these little things with the, with the um, bird seed because, you know, you couldn't do rice anymore because birds eat that and they swell up and die. But um, you do those little bird seed bags and stuff like that so they could throw, throw stuff. I didn't understand why we were preparing to get bombed. But anyway, um, you know, the little things that you did, the little frilly things, little pretty things, you know, it's got to look pretty, you know. And it's got to look this and that and, 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 and thinking about, uh, <clears throat> you know, all the details, that come, you know, you just kind of get caught up in that. And there's nothing wrong with preparation and so forth, but you know that that bride is passionate about that wedding day, is she not? And she's going to drive people crazy because she's passionate about getting ready for that day. How often does Jesus come up in your conversation? How, how often does your relationship with God come up with the people you're around? All of this will determine the direction your life is going. Your passions determine the direction that your life will go. And when you're at the judgment seat of Christ, what's going to show up? What's going to show up? I'm not talking about the judgment whether you go to heaven or hell. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that's the great white throne judgment in Revelation. But I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ, what actually the Greek word is bima. It's the place of reward. That when we stand before Jesus as he's having that final preparation with us before the marriage supper of the Lamb and, and, just, and just making us into the image of Jesus in its full extent, you know, there is going to be a moment where we will stand before Jesus and determine what we did in our life as a Christian and how that may or may not have pointed people to Jesus. The 
again, it's not determined in location in eternity. It determines reward. It determines how passionate you were about it. But listen, I, I just believe, and I, I, I'm not a judge by any means, but I just believe that there is a fine line sometimes, and it's hard for us as human beings to see that line. It's hard for us to understand, you know, because all we see is the fruit bearing. We don't see the heart. Jesus sees the heart. That's why he says not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. He sees the heart. He sees the intent. He sees why we do what we do. But I believe if we're really appreciative of what Jesus Christ has done for us, he has set us free from the curse of sin. If that's really true about us, then there are going to be a lot of moments when we're passionate about that relationship, so much so that not only are we going to want to spend time alone with God, but we're going to want to share those times with others. We're going to want to share what Jesus is doing in our lives. And I'm not preaching this today to make you feel bad about yourself because I believe it's important. And I, I, I was thinking the other day, man, what if this is my last sermon? What if it's the last opportunity I get to preach in my lifetime here on earth? I realize when I, when I think like that, it helps me speak the truth knowing that you're not going to like what I have to say. Because Jesus is pleading with you. He wants to not just be a small part of your life. He wants, he wants you to allow him to be in every asset of his life, every part of your life. If you're really passionate about your relationship with Jesus Christ, then people around you will know that. And my question is, do they know that? You see, your faith is not a private, personal thing. There's a lot of politicians that have said that. that oh, yeah, you know, that religion, keep religion out of, out of government. You know, keep religion out of government. You know, religion is a personal, private thing. No, you take Jesus everywhere. It's a relationship that's ongoing that influences the way you think and the decisions you make. It's not a private thing. It is a public thing. It should be a public thing. People should know, yes, I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's personal, but it shouldn't be private. People should know where I stand in my relationship with God. Number two. Not only your passions determine the direction of your life, but your passions point to the one you serve. Your passions point to the one you serve. What drove Jesus to do what he did? What did he say? The food that I'm eating, what really satisfies me, what really gives me meaning and direction to go on is to do the Father's will. To do the Father's will. Jesus saying, in essence, I may miss a moment, I may miss a meal for myself, but my real passion is to serve. My real passion is to do the Father's will. Jesus came to earth not to be served, but to serve. So if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to be passionate about serving Jesus Christ. If you really are going to be truthful about where you are in your relationship with God, it's going to show. You can say and sing and, and do all you want as far as, you know, you can get up Sunday morning, you can raise your hands, you can sing a song, and you can be like, yeah, that's a good song. I love the words of that song. But if you're not living out the words... then it's hypocritical. That old hymn, I surrender all, do you really? Do you really? Or do you just surrender, ha surrender half? Or just this portion? I, I give God my Sundays. Amen. Rest of the week's mine. I surrender all. 
How can anybody even sing those words if you don't mean it? No turning back. No turning back. Because a true follower of Jesus will not turn back and turn away like Demas to Paul. Remember that? Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He went back. He went back. And 1 John tells us why he went back, because he was never of us in the first place. So what are you passionate about? What drives you? What drives you to do what you do? Who in your life influences your decisions the most? Who influences your decisions? Y'all all know that raised kids, you can pretty much determine over time what influences your kids' decisions. And a lot of times it's not you, is it? It's peers, it's friends. It's wanting to be liked. I think social media is one of the worst things that could happen to our teenagers. Bullying has reached a different level. Looking at yourself the wrong way has reached a different level. It's frustrating, isn't it? To see your kids make decisions that they feel like are best for themselves while pushing their parents and even God himself away. What are you passionate about? Because your passions will simply point to the one you serve. We try our best as a staff to give as many people as possible an opportunity to serve. In this pandemic, it's been a challenge because we can't get together like we used to in the same kind of way. We've had to rethink things. But one of the things that we discover for sure that Jesus never intended for the church to be just about gathering. It's important. And it's obviously not about location. It certainly shouldn't have been an institution. It's a movement of God's people. The word church, we've made it kind of a noun, but it's a verb. It is a, it is a gathering of people to go out and serve. Because when we're here, this is the pep rally. This should be the opportunity to charge us, to get us charged up and ready for the week. This is not, we don't, we don't come here, enjoy it, and then leave it here. We take it with us. We take it with us. This, this should be a pep rally. <laughs> this should be an opportunity to be encouraged and blessed and it's a time of worship because once we leave these doors, there's the opportunity we have as a church to be the church God has intended for us to be wherever we go, whatever we do. At work, at school, wherever we go, we need to be that, that ambassador for Jesus, a representative of Jesus Christ, somehow, some way. Yes, we will do our best to give you opportunities to serve, but while you're going to work, you have an opportunity to serve the people you work with. When you go to school, you have an opportunity to serve your classmates, to serve your teachers. You'd be surprised, students, how much you can be an encouragement to your teacher if you just go up to your teacher and say, I recognize that this has got to be hard on you, and I just want you to know I'm praying for you. And ask your teacher. This will blow your teacher's mind. Ask your teachers anything I can help you pray about. You'd be surprised. We, praise God, there's 36 people that, gave us, that were teachers that gave us prayer requests. Be surprised how many people just wants us to 
care and reach out, the influence you can have. The great spiritual revivals that took place, and I know I've said this before, but the great spiritual revivals that took place, Spiritual Awakening 1 and 2 that took place here in America that has been documented has all been started by students. Students. Kids. Young adults. The influence, the opportunity we all have to serve. If you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to follow his example. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. You see a need, fill a need. Fill a need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your precious and marvelous word. God, stir up the passions that a lot of my brothers and sisters once had. Stir those things up, Father. Maybe they, maybe somebody here today hasn't yet entered a relationship with Jesus Christ, so none of this has made sense to them. But God, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, God, that you'll convict their hearts, help them to see where they stand with you, that they need a Savior. They need a life that has meaning and direction and clarity. So God, I, I just ask you in the name of Jesus. deal with the, every heart and mind that's either here in my presence or online. God, they just take this moment to ask themselves the question with all honesty, what am I passionate about? What am I passionate about? What would my closest friends say if I asked them the question, what do they think I'm passionate about? Sometimes what we think about ourselves isn't what other people see. And God, the things that we do, the places we go, the money we spend, shows the world what we're passionate about. Where our treasure is, there will our hearts also be. So God, help us to see reality. Help us to see where we are right now. Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? Every brother and sister in Christ that's here today, just all of you just stand with me. You know, you, you can pray at your seat. I get that. And especially right now with everything, I know there's, you like to be cautious, but just if you can, wear your mask and just come to the altar and say, Lord, reignite those passions in me. God, I, I want to do the right thing. I want to serve. God, get move me in the direction to serve. And when you're praying that today, Pray every morning. Tomorrow morning, before you go to work, God, give me an opportunity to serve and represent you. Get to thinking about what Jesus has done for you and what he wants to do for you and that the fact that he loves you and he's looking out for you. Just, just dwell on that. Count your blessings and then let that motivate you to go and serve. Hey, if you enjoyed today's message, we want to encourage you to like it or share it on social media. Also, head over to our website, BethelBaptistVA.com, or our mobile app, and click on the giving link where you can help us continue to share the message of Jesus across the world. God bless you, and have an awesome week.